Yeah. We just got done raising $30,000 last month for Young Life. And tomorrow night we're hosting a culmination of a fundraiser. Actually, we've designed a fundraising model. Okay. Uh, Tell me about that. Yeah. So yeah. So because I'm not any cooler than anybody, I serve on six nonprofit boards. I've been in this community a long time. I and other people write checks and support lots of different things. And, yeah. and I just have found what I think to be the most efficient way to raise money. And so okay. you can have car washes and you can get 20 people out in the hot sun for half a day and raise 400 bucks. But, but yeah, but to really make impact, you got to raise serious money. And yeah. yeah. So we've just shrunken down a process that, that helps a nonprofit. Awesome. Tim, thanks again for coming on. I really appreciate you taking some time. For the people who have not had the pleasure of meeting you, tell me a little bit about yourself and some of the projects you have going on. Yeah, I've been in our local community quite a while. I was a small business owner for a good portion of my life. And then for 15 years, I pastored a church in the area. And then me and some friends started a mentoring organization that led us back into the marketplace and buying the facility that we have now. And integrating a whole bunch of stuff into that, into this building. Yeah. That's a flash forward version of it. So this is my, a combination of what I think is my entrepreneurial gifts and my civic and ministry minded self. Right. And so what kind of business did you have before? You said you were a business owner previously. Yeah. I owned a couple of businesses from the time I was 20, mostly in, in finances. And then I owned a small mortgage company and then, okay. uh, yeah. So then how what, do you go about deciding to purchase a bowling center? Yeah, we're actually a nonprofit mentoring organization that does stuff right. all over, all over tons of different things. But the couple that owned it were 81 and 80 years old and I'm on six nonprofit boards. And so I was leaving a board meeting and somebody said, Hey, Don and Ann really need to sell town and country lanes, which was the previous owners for 54 years and didn't really do anything about it for a month or two. And then we were growing as an organization as an organization and needed more space and opportunity. And we knew we wanted as a nonprofit to engage in the marketplace some, but we were thinking smaller, maybe a coffee shop. And then, and so I came down and came to the counter. I said, Hey, is Don here? And Don came forward and he goes, Hey, don't you have something to do with Valor Mentoring? And I said, Oh, actually I'm the founder and the president. And he said, wow. He goes, you want to buy the place? And I'm like, actually <laughs> I do. And yeah. So long story short, we worked out a, a deal. They gave us a, a discount on the building for, because of who we are and what we're doing. And then, yeah. And then it's been a, we've been in it two and a half years now. So very cool. Is that, had you had any experience in the bowling world previous to that? No, I bowled twice a year, like every other American right. type of thing yep. with groups and stuff. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's yeah. awesome. So, uh, tell me a little bit about some of the stuff that you've learned recently for taking that over. Yeah. Yeah. There was a, a base of good employees that were here and yeah, yeah but we were going to shift the culture quite a bit from being just a, a, maybe a steady declining center to infusing a lot of the other opportunities in the community into the building. So you had to manage those expectations too, but I learned a lot. We were, we took over a center that, that really had a, a lot of issues from a facilities perspective, from a roof and different things. And so we just went after those things and within eight months, we had put on a brand new roof and, and added new pins and started lane machines and just slowly going through and improving as we had resource to do that. And so now we're two and a half years and about 900,000 in oh, wow. on, 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 on total improvements. And uh, yeah, and, but our business plan and our, the board that I'm on and stuff, we have really bright people from Boeing, Intel, Nike, all kinds of bright people. So we built a plan and worked it and it's paying off. And mm -hmm. we continue to serve the leagues and some tournaments and that type of stuff, as well as engage the open bowl and corporate event type thing. Yeah. So are you open to the public and everybody? Is it just for like more, more of the events yep. you have? It's okay. a public access seven day a week bowling alley. Just, okay. we have, I'm in one of our conference rooms right now. So we, that's one of part of the renovations is we have two state-of-the-art conference rooms that have 65 inch flat screens and whiteboards and water coolers and a microwave and like a board table. This, I'm the table that I'm, that my computer's on is actually made from a bowling alley lane. Maybe we can just. Oh, very cool. Oh yeah. So I love it. It's a nine foot 
one of a kind custom. And this was actually built by Oregon State Penitentiary. And so through our mentoring program, we mentor some people in incarceration and stuff. And so they have a big factory where they produce office furniture. And there was a bowling alley that closed down and we bought four of the lanes of wood. And, and so all of our tables downstairs were made out of that wood, as well as this conference room. And so just continue to leverage our partnerships with the, the both the civic and the government and, and private public right. and all that. Yeah, yeah. No, I love that. I, I love when they repurpose that. One of my neighbors has a local uh, lane that they use the, as a their bar in their basement, the part the center that I am a partner in. We also have our conference rooms made out of it too. They're very heavy. Yeah. Very heavy. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> this than is you maple. Think. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> it wasn't the pine version. Yeah. 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 Well, that's what's yeah. cool is it the front of it is the maple and then the back is the pine because the front has all the weight. So there's two different gotcha. woods. I didn't know that until recently. Neither did I also never knew how difficult it is to take that stuff out of a bowl. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, so tell me a little bit, because one of the things that I wanted to talk to you about or to get your insights on is how the mentoring kind of works into it. So obviously these centers are, are running a staff and they got to present some leadership. How has the mentoring for you played a role in running the center? Yeah, it's given us a safe place for youth to come and be mentored as well. We do at schools and on-site and group mentoring up using these conference rooms. Of course, having large groups of kids coming into bowl around exposure to our organization. And then over time, some raise their hand and say, I'd like a mentor and so yeah. on. So engaging that in, in the process and we're we drive Kids Bowl Free really mm -hmm. big. I think in our region, we're the number one Kids Bowl Free program. I think oh, awesome. we gave away 6,000 games of bowling mm -hmm. last year to wow. kids 16 and under. Yeah. We, we use this facility. So it is, I'm in Marion and Polk County mm -hmm. for Oregon. And because of the other boards I serve on, also we provide free bowling to every foster care family uh, oh, wow. and every safe, every safe families which is another support system for people that are needing respite care and that mm -hmm. type of stuff. So those families all bowl for free here. Oh, wow. So yeah, we give away a lot of bowling. Yeah. Um, so, that's really yeah. cool. Yeah. A piece of the community and it's not super, it's not like it costs you a lot to give that away, especially in the summer. Yeah. Yeah. And actually we do that year round. Okay. Yeah. But having said that, the lights are on, the, the heat is on, the staff right. is in. So we, of course, limit that's usually we run that stuff before five o'clock, but mm -hmm. on the foster care side, we allow those families to come even on the weekends. And so, oh, interesting. Okay. yeah. And I suppose the ROI both in, and I think doing the right thing with who we know in our community, but it gives us a tremendous amount of public uh, acknowledgement because of what we're doing at companies and other people help to sponsor things we're doing because of right. who we are yeah. and how we're going about it. Yeah. So it's all working out financially as well as a community impact so on. So right. it's a pretty unique model though. Yeah. That's, yeah. That's one of the things that really interests me that I want to learn more about just because I, I hadn't heard that before. Because like you said, getting sponsorships, it's not a lot of local centers are going to get sponsorships because they're typically for profit. And right. do you get like funding or are you just self-sufficient or a lot of nonprofits, you fundraise or get grants or do you guys do that as well? Or is it strictly self-sufficient? Yes. Yes. And okay. yeah, as we started, it was all private funding. And then as we've grown and then if you took this center and continue to grow, now we're getting some grant funding and, and other ways because of the other connections, uh, mm -hmm. we might be able to service foster care and other things. And occasionally we'll get some county money or something because of what we're doing. So, yeah. Yeah. Balancing all that with leagues and tournaments is something we were sensitive to. And right. we definitely are still going to be a tournaments and leagues place, but in the other evenings, we want to be leveraging the facility to help the community. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And do you do a lot of then fundraisers for other nonprofits at, at your center? We do actually. We well. Yeah. And we just got done raising $30,000 last month for Young Life. And tomorrow night we're hosting a culmination of a fundraiser. Actually, we've designed a fundraising model. Okay. Uh, Tell me about that. Yeah. So yeah. So because I'm not any cooler than anybody, I serve on six nonprofit boards. I've been in this community a long time. I and other people write checks and support lots of different things. And, yeah. and I just have found what I think to be the most efficient way to raise money. And so okay. you can have car washes and you can get 20 people out in the hot sun for half a day and raise 400 bucks. But, but yeah, but to really make impact, you got to raise serious money. And yeah. yeah, so we've just shrunken down a process that, that helps a nonprofit engage their, let's say their 10 board members and maybe 15 of their most connected 
people to the organization. And okay. then we've just built a very systematic process for those, let's say in this model, those 25 people to go out and get 10 people to donate, let's say a hundred bucks. Okay. So in that model, that's 25. It takes only three to five hours for those people to go wow. to, to get wow. 10 between emails and text and then having a coffee or two with somebody. Hey, can you help me? I love this organization. I'm in for a hundred or I'm in for 250. Yeah. Would you, would you mind? Sorry about that. You know, would you mind kicking in? And so mm -hmm. that's in a nutshell, that's what it is. But then we built a way to follow up with the teams and there's a little bit of competitiveness to the different people. Hey, I see you got seven of your 10 and that type yeah. of thing. But, oh, very cool. But yeah, but this organization that, that I help now, they, their event is tomorrow night and they're at about 62,000 that, that we've helped them raise. Wow. And so wow. they do recovery homes for men and women. So people mm -hmm. coming out of addiction. And so, yeah, again, it's how can we use the facility? Not unlike you or anybody else, when we took the facility over, in my opinion, every square foot's got to pay its rent. That's the way I look at it. So, and God bless the folks that had this building before us, but there was four pool tables here and that really the four pool tables. So we're down to one pool table and mm -hmm. larger amounts of restaurant space and the 200 inch television screen on that. So just going through there and making every foot count. So, yeah. Profit per square foot. That's the name of the game. Absolutely. Yeah. Where can we get another video game? Where can we get um, that's really cool. I, I didn't, 62,000 is a lot for a fundraiser. I've heard of people doing maybe 20 or so here for a good cause, but that's pretty impressive that you're able to raise that. We've had coached them along the way. We've built this process and yeah, it's just because of years of going to tons and tons of lunches every year mm -hmm. and you either get to the end of this presentation, you write a check or you don't or whatever. But this also culminates in mostly just a celebration. We call it a bowl -a -thon. It's really just the people who were raising the money and the people who contributed come and eat and bowl and have fun. And it's not like it's work that night. You're not still trying to get people to give money or right. run 50 person silent auction thing yeah. or whatever. So yeah. And so it's and really then, efficient. That's what attracted mm -hmm. me to us building the model. Right. Yeah. That's impressive. Cause you could talk to any nonprofit organization and you tell them if the numbers that you've seen, like that's pretty appealing. And then yeah. I love when you, obviously the facility is helping give back to the com community, but also the center then becomes a place for people to gather and it's going to draw in yes. people who haven't gone there before might not bowl and you become an, an arbiter of goodwill in the community it's all yeah. win, wins around yeah it's really increased our we had a good reputation in the community but the amount of mm -hmm. people we can serve we have 500 people a day coming through our facility so right. yeah yeah it's just more opportunities and then from the center's perspective you just rent out the whole house or something like that or you donate right. that or yep. how, how do you do that yeah. So we charge a few percent on doing it, which includes pizza that night and the use of the facility. That's so let's say we would, for a three hour block, we would normally, let's say we charge 1500 on an off night, like mm -hmm. a, when we don't have a league and it's summertime. So we just factored those things in to what we're charging them to help run the, not the event. Yeah. So, yeah. So we make a little bit of money, but, but we're empowering them. Like they've never been, been empowered before. These people now have 114 new donors that they didn't have before that. So right. they get to interact with those folks all throughout the year, right. just tomorrow night. So yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not about, yeah, the center and they get new customers coming in. Like we said, who see that. Yep. That's yeah. very cool. And so yeah. give, give me recap that again. So you have the 10 people on the board, 15 people who are involved and they each get 10. Yes, yeah, so that's 25 people in right. this model. And you're asking everybody, and we have a little agreement that they sign. It's not legal binding, but hey, you're committing between now and 98 days from now, and we're going to have this event. You're going to find 10 people. And then, and so whether it's $100, or $250, or whatever, I just ask, like, you put up the first whatever. If you got 100 bucks, great. If you're a person mm -hmm. who more means and you want to say 250 and you start asking your friends for 250 But in that model, if it was just 10 right? Then that's 25 K because right. each person comes back with a thousand and donors at a hundred and so on. Yeah. So it, it, the lift is fairly light, right? Mm -hmm. Other than the follow-up and the challenging them. So we have week after week, we'll check in with them. Hey, I see you got six blah, 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 and just kind of mm -hmm. encouraging that growth. Yeah. Cause that's not a huge number about 10 people. Um, so then, cause a lot of times I've seen it with, they'll sell a team and then they're bringing six people times all the different lanes. That's probably more people than what you're talking about. And then do you yeah, sponsor some of the 20, lanes? Yeah. Yeah. And that's just, there's different models for sure. And I'm not saying this is the perfect one. It's just the one that we've mm -hmm. developed. So yeah, no, it sounds to be really successful, a huge number. Yeah. And then yeah. is it just like a tournament or you just bowl a few games or what's the structure of it's the just event? Bowling. Like? Yeah. It's just bowling and food and hanging mm -hmm. out and they'll do a presentation. We have a, a stage area where they'll have one of their, a couple of their recovery people mm -hmm. in, in this case tomorrow night that 
tell a little bit of their story about how that is. So it's more helping bond people to what they gave to. Yeah, of course. And of course, yeah. And then our nonprofit has a whole media side of what we do. So we have Netflix quality cameras and a production studio right. and all that. So, so we'll often help make some concise videos of their people telling their story about the, yeah. the organization because live people get nervous and it's hard sure. to get them going or shut them down. Once they get going, <laughs> video is a better way of doing it. But yeah, it's just, we've got this facility, wanted to serve the community. And it feels like the more we keep doing, the more money keeps coming in and the more mm -hmm. people keep partnering with us. Yeah. Yeah. I really like yeah. that. Like I said, it's win-win all the way around for everybody involved. Yep. Yeah. We'll have to take that to, to some of our clients and, and use that. I, I like that a lot. Yeah. Obviously the fundraisers are working well. What else is working for you to help grow the center and promote the organization? Yeah. So we're pretty involved in the from public school, private school, the uh, homeschool networks, the faith community, youth groups are constantly down here by 20 to 100 and 150 kids, or just at the beginning of the school years, we have a lot of the elementary schools come in. We will give them uh, their, an elementary school, a carpet, some pins and a plastic ball and have mm -hmm. them take that as PE for okay. a, a week or so sure. in an elementary school. And then they return that, but then they bring 50 or 75 kids to re really bowl yeah. once. Oh, so cool. we're yeah. just, we're really involved in the, in the school system. And then the, between that, between the faith community, the schools and the civic stuff, place stays pretty full. Yeah. And so then is, is that something that you have a league director doing or is that all on you or how do you? Yeah, no, like, yeah, so we have somebody who oversees our leagues and, and tournaments and then mm -hmm. it balances between, we have an events person because with mm -hmm. our conference rooms and all the partnerships right. we Makes have, sense. we do a lot of that. And so it's shared by them, the booking mm -hmm. side of that. But yeah, it's a lot to stay in touch with all them. Yeah. Yep. Cool. Yeah. Cool. Anything else that you guys are seeing that's working really well to keep the place full, maybe uh, on the weekends or evenings other than leagues? Yeah, for sure. Kids Bowl Free has been something. I know it's a mixed bag in our industry, yeah. whether people like it or they don't like it. But for us, we run it till five o'clock every day of the week. And okay. yeah, and that's been beneficial for us. And then also being able to talk about how many games you gave away, right? You post yeah. that on your, on your newsletters and your year reviews, it, it helps engage people in the community. Right. Yeah. Like you said, it's a good look to, to be involved in a community like that. Yeah. And I think other things we've done from a profitability perspective in our restaurant, the margins are high. The menu is narrower maybe than, okay. than in some places, which brings inventory efficiency, which brings serving times down, all that other stuff yeah, that of course. you can get coached up on, but we don't apologize for margin. We just mm -hmm. don't. No. I, I tell people all the time when I go to the movie theater, which is maybe, I don't know, I don't go all that often, but when I do, I get a big bucket of popcorn and I get a big pack of Twizzlers. That might be the only time of the year I buy Twizzlers, but when I go to the movie theater, that's what I want. And so when people come to bowling, they don't, they're not necessarily wanting a, a five-star meal. They want a good burger or, or some, some fries and, right. and they're going to pay a premium for it. Yeah. So. Yeah. You want to offer a quality product. And I've seen a lot of, of people, their expectations have gone up as far as what a bowling center offers before it might've been like a hot dog or sausage and chips or something like that. But now people like, they want a, a, like a quality burger, not just something that's frozen in the back. Yeah. And in each of those areas, we run a premium, we run a premium French fry. We run a, mm -hmm. a, a premium burger. That's at least a third pound and lower in fat. Just some of those things. It doesn't cost that much more compared to mm -hmm. what you're charging to, to make that next step up. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I have not one, but two clients in smaller places, but they have the best restaurant in town in their bowling center. And they trying to get, it takes a little bit for people to realize that, but once they go, they realize that this is the best place to eat in town and the people, are, uh, people want that. I, I think. Yeah. So our facility is called the rec. Okay. So for recording or recreation, but we have a nine napkin rec burger. So okay. it is. And so just, yeah, people will come in yeah. and order that they'll pay a premium for a, right. a big burger. So. Yeah. It's an experience having to use nine napkins. Right. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I love it. Then uh, we should probably talk about this a little bit at the beginning, but what is the mission then of the, the nonprofit? What's the overall goal that you guys? Yeah. With? Yeah. So if you look across the landscape, 90% of every incarcerated person in America is from a fatherless home. 90% okay. of every homeless runaway, 87% of dropout, 77% of drug addiction and alcoholism, all from fatherless homes. Wow. And 43% of every child in America is in a home without a father. 43%. Wow. So I don't say that from any chauvinist perspective. No. I'm just saying that that's a gap that, that, that will hurt. Right yeah. Now. And yeah. And so that's the lane we're running in providing mentoring and even more specific, mostly male mentoring and to the fatherless and, and 
and we got an endless line as fast as we can recruit and bring people on. Yeah, we have like kids it. waiting to, to get in line for it. Yeah. Wow. That's incredible. And now if people want to be a part of it or donate or where, where would be the best place to learn more, just because we're going to send this out to lots of people. Yeah. Yeah. So Valor Mentoring is our nonprofit. So Valor, like V is in Victor, A-L-O-R, and then mentoring and just ValorMentoring.com. We have built software and a mentoring app that we're finishing up. So we actually intend to be in all 50 states in the next 15 years. Mm. Very cool. So, yeah. Now I'm not like bowling alley by bowling alley, right? Sure. But, yeah. But from a mentoring perspective. Right. If you're out there and you got a, a facility that you think you're looking to sell, I mm -hmm. think we've built a model that we're willing to buy more facilities. Yeah. So, no, that's really cool. Thing. Yeah. So, no, I've, I've talked yeah. to, to, there's a lot of centers that were opened in, in the sixties from a, a bunch of different attractive leasing offers. And we're coming to the end of a lot of those generations. I think a lot of centers will be up for sale just because people are ready to retire. I've seen it a lot, multiple yeah. times. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I'm grateful for all those generations of owners and bowlers beforehand. I knew Don and Ann, who were the previous owners for 53 years, and he worked here six years before he owned it. Mm -hmm. Came here at 19 or 20 years old. His, my entire life, he's been here serving the community, running the bowling alley. And so, yeah. Yeah. So, so like, we, we named this conference room after them. Oh, so cool. when you go online to register to, to use this room, it's the Lee Bowl yeah. room. Yeah. And so we think it's really important to honor their town and country lanes was the name of the bowling alley. And so right. a beautiful, huge neon sign that was town and country. We paid, moved it in and it's above our restaurant now. Oh, so we cool. continue to honor the, the heritage of, yeah. of that with the, the newness of maybe our twist on what we're doing. So, yeah, no, yeah. I, I like that. That's really cool. That's always been one of my favorite things about the bowling industry is that it is a staple of the community, especially from a family focus. I've always loved that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Great. We're getting yeah. close to time. I wanted to ask you a couple questions before we finish up is sure. where do you see things going over the next, let's say three or so years for the bowling industry? Where do you see the industry moving to? Yeah. Some things people don't want to hear and some things people do. And I, and it's hard for, cause you know, I come as an two and a half years ago would be perceived as an outsider. Sure. Deeply committed to the community and I care about the industry and that type of stuff. So we, we continue to focus on it. Like when the pandemic was on and uh, OS, which is the, like the high school uh, athletic thing, they weren't going to do a, a bowling tournament in 2020 or 21 okay. for state championships. So we did, we had oh, wow. two times the trophies. We gave away $2,500 in college scholarship money and we mm -hmm. filled it in a week and the place was, so just continue to do some things like that. But I, I think you, you're pretty much going to have to find that balance between league and tournament and open bowling because of the money is probably better in the open bowl. If we're getting just, I'm just talking financial, I'm not talking sure. industry wise, but yeah. So finding that balance, because I think what's happening right now is people are either all entertainment, all league and bowling. And, at least my passions yeah. would be a blend of the two yeah. without disregarding one. It, and then I know it's really early, but it seems like at some point string is going to take over. I don't know mm -hmm. what that looks like, but it already uh, has for new projects. Yep. Yeah. Uh, for, yeah. Yeah. I think uh, some of the bigger folks had 2000 lanes last year. They have 4,500 this year that they're putting mm -hmm. And yeah. And we're an older center. We have 82 seventies and we're in this spring, we're putting in a new scoring system and and probably new machines. Oh, really? Yeah. So the industry will probably make its decisions at least a little bit by next spring so that yep. we'll decide what's best to do. Yeah. Yep. And then I think, again, if everybody would just, you got to, even you, is you're young and successful and ambitious, but we tend to lean towards what we've always done. And I think mm -hmm. whether you're selling napkins, burgers, or bowling, you need to always try to fight against that to continue to innovate. Oh, I, like I think as bowling centers, I think we need to consider that. Look, listen, I'm not any smarter than anybody else out there, but how can every square foot pay its rent? So when we took over, there was five different vendors of, of video games and Papa shop machines that were flat basketballs and whatever. And so it wasn't a real popular move, but I said, thank you, but you're all dismissed. Like we found one great vendor that comes in and keeps top notch machines in there. Now there's this revenue that happens every month and it increases the experience for our customers because they can afford yeah. to bring in better games than I can read or write mm -hmm. a $25,000 check for a pinball machine or whatever it is. Sure. So that's a move that also I think that we've done well with is to continue to just have somebody who's a pro that already can do that. And it's mm -hmm. a passive income for us. Yeah. So, yeah. Outsource some of those items and offer new product lines essentially. Yep. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 I really like that. Yeah. 
I think shorter leagues is probably going to continue to get more popular with our yeah. short attention span culture, but the future will be told. It's not necessarily your or my opinion. It's going to count. Yeah, no, yeah. I've definitely seen some of that, but it doesn't necessarily have to be shorter league. You can do two 15s back to back or a couple of different eights back to back where it's still the same people. But if you need to sit out a season, you can, you know, the flexibility. Yeah, it's like what we're doing. We have the 32s, mm -hmm. a chunk of those that run, but we'll do a nine pin no tap for it eight or 10 weeks for couples or whatever. It's more yeah. of an entry point. Like it's nobody's ever been in a league before, but they have fun coming down here. Here's just mm -hmm. a step closer to being a part of the community. Okay. So, yeah. I don't think that short leagues will totally take over, but offering one of them on a slower night, I think has worked well for us. And so right. knows. Yeah. That in uh, social leagues too, where it's might not be sanctioned, but it could be their first foray into a league base where it's more fun and food and beverage oriented, but now they're a leaguer and who knows from there, they could take another step. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. But I like how, I like what you said about mixing the two traditional league and tournament and the open play, because really a podcast guest that I had on previously has painted it really well to his league base saying that the open play people, uh, they might not be as knowledgeable about what you're trying to do and the etiquette and all these things, they do provide a lot of the funding so that we can have better stuff here and have a better experience for you. So letting them know, Hey, we're all in this together and, and it balances out. That is it's hard line to walk. Yeah. And then one of our, so I'm in Oregon, our president of our association or whatever, we were in Vegas for the thing and having dinner and, and we're all walking through price increases, right? Mm -hmm. Because everything you're buying is costing you more money and same with me. And, but he started this line about four years ago when somebody's like, gosh, we got price increases. Wait, no, he goes, you want me to raise prices? You want me to raise prices. They're like, why is that? Because you want that $50,000 oiling machine to right. be working well. And you want to not have a leaky roof on. So he just mm -hmm. he flipped it right around. And so now I use that. I, there you go. Right. There's a nugget to take away from. If like you actually that. just flip the script on them, like really you want us to raise prices because your experience is going to be. Exactly. Uh, yeah. It's going back to, into your experience. I like that. Yeah. That's really cool. Yeah. All right. Last thing I wanted to ask you, cause we are coming up on time is the, uh, what would be your top piece of advice for a proprietor? Say someone else is getting into the industry or maybe they're at a turning point and they want to double down. What would be your top piece of advice to a proprietor? Yeah. The first thing that pops in my mind is associations. I'm in a lot of arenas and so we're a part of chamber, like the chamber of commerce. And of course mm -hmm. we're a part of our Oregon board association as well as the national. And I think that is some of the best money we spend the return on that stuff between the discounts on whether it's Pepsi and whatever. Right. Yeah. I just think that compared to that five to 800, 900, $1,200 a year on stuff, the return on that is, is a no brainer. And so the other thing I would say, be a part of your local chamber of commerce, two to 800 bucks. And unlike most other businesses in that chamber, everybody can use your product. Everybody. I might be an insurance salesman, but not everybody is going to switch insurance, but their staff, their families, whatever, everybody can come to the bowling center and have right. fun. You yep. know, and that what that's what makes it, in my opinion, such ROI. Yeah. And they yeah. all need a place to have one of those mixers too. Yep. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. I like that. Awesome. Again, thanks, thanks for coming on, Tim. This has been a really great discussion. We'll have to do another one in the future. If anyone's interested in what you do, whether Valor Mentoring or the REC, what's the best way to get in touch with you or learn more? Yeah, yeah. Just ValorMentoring.com, our phone number. You can text us right off our website. You'll see that we have some pretty innovative uh, technology people. Mm -hmm. And yeah, and, we, and if you have questions about from fundraising to some of these other things we talked about, I'm glad to help. So, yeah, yeah. that would be great. Yeah, no, I'm sure you'll get some outreach on that. That's really sure. valuable. Awesome. Yeah. All right. Thanks, Tim. Yeah. We'll be in, in touch soon. Appreciate it. Yeah.